So I will now recognize Mr. Thierer to please begin your opening statement. Thank you. Chairwoman Mays, Ranking Member Connolly, and members of the subcommittee, thank you for holding this hearing and for the invitation to appear before you. My name is Adam Thierer, and I'm a senior fellow with the R Street Institute, where I focus on emerging technology issues. I also recently served as commissioner for the U.S. Chamber of Commerce Commission on Artificial Intelligence, Competitiveness, Inclusion, and Innovation. My message here today boils down to three main points. First, it is important to recall the foundational principles behind the bipartisan national framework for digital commerce that Congress and the Clinton administration crafted a quarter century ago. Freedom to innovate was made America's policy default. Lawmakers rejected the inefficient old regulatory models of the analog era, which constrained entrepreneurialism and competition. We allowed new digital technologies to be born free and to flourish without excessive micromanagement. And then we used ongoing multi-stakeholder efforts and flexible regulatory responses to address concerns. Europe took the opposite path. And today, heavy-handed technocratic mandates have, quote, regulated its way to last place, as a recent Wall Street Journal headline observed. In fact, 18 of the 25 largest digital, te digital technology companies in the world today are US-based, while it is difficult to name any that are headquartered in Europe. While some people have concerns about large technology companies today, we should agree that it is better that these firms are primarily based here in the United States instead of China, Europe, or other countries or continents. Further, there is a second point about the connection between AI policy and broader national objectives. A strong digital technology base is an important source of strength and prosperity. So it is essential that our nation not shoot itself in the foot as the next great technological race gets underway with China and the rest of the world. Consider this scenario. When OpenAI launched ChatGPT in late 2022, it quickly became the most rapidly adopted digital technology in history, and competing U.S. services from U.S. developers followed quickly. Had a Chinese operator launched a major generative AI model first, it would have been a Sputnik moment for America. Luckily, it is instead foreign nations who are today left scratching their heads wondering how America once again raced ahead of them on digital technology. Wise policy choices not only strengthen our economy and provide better products and jobs, but also bolster our national security and allow our values to shape information technology platforms and markets globally. We need a national AI policy that is flexible and pro-innovation to make sure our firms, workers, and values continue to lead the world in this fashion. This brings me to the Biden administration's October executive order. This wide-ranging 100-plus page directive has been praised by some as a logical response to congressional inaction on AI. But many others have rightly noted that it stretches executive authority over emerging technology well beyond statutory limits and raises the danger of overregulation. For example, the order flips the Defense Production Act on its head and converts a 1950s law meant to encourage production into an expansive regulatory edict intended to curtail some forms of algorithmic innovation. 20 state attorneys general recently filed a letter with the Department of Commerce noting how the order is, quote, about regulating technological development, not about encouraging the production of anything, and also objecting to its effort to, quote, centralize government control over an emerging technology being developed by the private sector, end quote. The order also contains open-ended language about taking steps to combat algorithmic discrimination and pushes the Federal Trade Commission to get more aggressive in policing the AI marketplace. These steps open the door to a new regulatory regime for AI without any express authority from Congress. While other provisions of the order are more reasonable, Congress still needs to reassert itself to ensure that administrative overreach is curtailed and that agencies adhere to the Constitution and their congressionally delegated powers. Instead of these arbitrary excessive mandates, Congress needs to craft an AI policy vision that does four things. First, that is rooted in a flexible risk-based framework that relies more on ongoing multi-stakeholder negotiations and evolutionary standards that are more closely matched to rapidly changing algorithmic technologies. Second, which builds on existing government powers on a sectoral basis instead of trying to develop an entirely new regulatory superstructure for AI. Third, which preempts state and local government AI laws that create confusing patchworks of conflicting mandates, and fourth and most importantly, gives algorithmic entrepreneurs a green light and avoids treating AI services as guilty until proven innocent, as the executive order does. In sum, our nation must create a positive innovation culture and avoid trapping our AI innovators in a regulatory cage if we hope to prosper economically and ensure a safer, more secure technological base. It is essential that we strike the right policy balance as we face serious competition from China and other nations who are looking to counter America's early lead in computational systems and data-driven technologies. Thank you for holding this hearing, and thank you for the consideration of my views. I look forward to any questions you may have. My first question is, the Commerce Department could not protect Secretary Raimondo's own email account from being hacked 
last year. Yet this EO requires firms to share with the agency on a daily basis the crown jewel secrets of the most powerful AI systems on earth. First question, can we trust commerce to ensure this highly sensitive data doesn't fall into the hands of China or another foreign adversary? Yes or no? No. According to the executive order, the over 100 page executive order, irresponsible use of AI could exacerbate, quote, social harms, including, quote, disinformation. Should we trust the government to be the ultimate arbiter of what is disinformation and what may cause social harm in AI systems, Mr. Thierer? No. Should AI model developers have to give the government all their test results and test data, even those concerning politics or religion, Mr. Thierer? No. What are, some, high stakes. what are some of the, just very quickly, uh, the risks if companies are giving their test data over the, to the government, Mr. Thierer? There are security risks, of course. There are also concerns about how there might be speech meddling of various mm. types with the sort of jawboning that could be associated with that sort of heavy-handed approach. Do you think, what would the government do with such information, potentially? Well, it depends. We know in the past there's been efforts by government authorities to utilize such information to try to curb certain types of behaviors or to try to intimidate certain people to do things against their will and without due process. And then, well, my last point is, uh, you know, I think we can all learn something probably from recent history. Um, the FBI's interpretation of the Hunter Biden laptop as Russian disinformation, and we had a number of over 20 intel, former intel officers and, and folks that um, <laughs> wrote a letter saying it was Russian disinformation and come to find out uh, it, was, it was not. I think that's a concern that a lot of folks have on what the government will do with data, what the government will do with information, what the government will do with testing information, algorithms, uh, code and programming product, et cetera. The EO requires companies even considering developing dual use foundation AI models to report to the government on an ongoing basis again about their most sensitive business secrets. Could the justification for using the DPA here be used in the future to demand highly sensitive plans and data from firms in any emerging technology field? Mr. Thierer? Yes, it could, and we should avoid it for that reason. Uh, Mr. Thier, do you have any understanding of how this would be enforced uh, in, in regards to noncompliance? I mean, would, would the CEO or would board members go to jail? Like, how, do, how would that work? I think that's a great question. Re recall that in the letter that the 20 uh, AGs sent, they actually refer to this, quote, opaque and undemocratic process by forcing AI developers to submit information. But it was unclear to the AGs themselves, and they asked the Department of Commerce, like, what's going on here? So we don't have answers to your questions, Congressman. So basically, we took a problem and made it worse. Seems I, that way. I, I, I think so. But again, so, um, Mr. Th is it Thier? Thier, yes. Okay. In an analysis of the executive order last year, you stated that the unilateral and heavy handed administrative meddling in AI markets could undermine America's global competitiveness and even the nation's geopolitical security if taken too far. Um, has this executive order gone too far? It very well could. You know, Congressman, just this week, Saudi Arabia announced historic investment in its AI capacity, something like $40 billion. Last uh, September, the government of the UAE uh, came out with an open source AI model that is 2.5 times larger than America's largest open source AI model. So it's not just China we face off against, it's all sorts of countries. Russia just developed one of its biggest supercomputers. If this executive order shoots ourselves in the foot as a nation is in our, and holds back our innovative capacity, that has massive ramifications for our competitiveness and our geopolitical security. Yeah, my other question has to do with this, um, the fact that it was, the executive order establishes an HHS AI task force, tasked with developing a strategic plan to regulate aspects of AI in the healthcare industry, um, including research and discovery, drug and device safety, healthcare delivery and financing, and public health. Could this lead to an onslaught of additional regulations? Absolutely, and we we're already seeing it. We, we should keep in mind our federal government is massive. 438 federal departments, 2.2 million civilian workers working at them. Every one of these agencies is interested in taking a look at AI. This executive order essentially gives them the green light to do so and says go for it without any express congressional intent. You know, as someone who worked in the healthcare IT industry for 20 years, um, I can tell you that this place doesn't, doesn't aid, was, was not helpful in improving the lives of the American people when it passed um, under the um, American Recovery and Reinvestment Act 
the meaningful use criteria that every software uh, electronic medical risk record system had to accommodate in order to continue to receive full reimbursement from Medicare. Um, the outcome, I think, is, is, is uh, well, my statement, the outcome is basically proven that. And that is that all of what that regulation did was shut down many electronic medical record companies across the United States, which forced doctors to be con to consolidate, change their, their records, move them to, migrate them to a new platform, or to stand up a platform altogether that they weren't, you know, they were happy with the paper chart. Um, would you agree with me that the, that outcome, the creating ba what is basically a duopoly in the healthcare IT space is not good for doctors, not good for patients, not good for consumers? Yeah, well, of course not. And of course, this, this effort by the administration is just going to add more compliance costs and, and regulations on top of it. I know you mentioned this at the last hearing on this, Congressman, that these sorts of burdens can compile and, and, and build up on small innovators and force them to, uh, to move or, or get out of the field. Thank you. Um, and, you know, at the end of the day, um, it was said that if we don't take action, the states will take action. Well, I, I seem to recall that the United States Constitution and this, this system of government was not, didn't create the states. In fact, it's the other way around. The states created the federal government. And in the Tenth Amendment, it specifically says the power is not delegated to the United States by the Constitution, nor prohibited to it to the states, are reserved to the states respectively or to the people. So my question to you is, isn't a left to the states, wouldn't it be better to have a microcosm of experiments um, especially in a field that we know so little about at this point in time? Depends on the rules. There's a lot of proposals out there, a huge increase in uh, the sort of compliance burden if we have too much of a patchwork. The leading law on AI hiring right now in, in the nation is from New York City, not New York State, New York City. You can imagine if every city has its own plan on AI, that, that could be a problem. Thank you, my time has expired. And this is a question for the entire panel. How does this EO stifle innovation limit potentially investments in AI in the United States? Well, I'll just go back to the AG letter that really nailed it because they asked the Department of Commerce to answer some questions like you just asked, Congresswoman. And when they referred to that opaque and undemocratic process of forcing AI developers to submit information for review behind closed doors, they also then talked about the danger of a bureaucratic and nebulous supervisor process to discourage development, further entrench large incumbents, and do little to protect citizens. They asked a whole series of questions like you're asking to the administration. I haven't seen any answers back. Well, and so any thoughts on <clears throat> with this kind of regulation happening, how we stay uh, at least not just one, two, but a couple steps ahead of our adversaries around the world, Mr. Thayer? Yeah, very briefly, uh, Congressman, you're exactly right. You got some time. <laughs> But I, this is why I spoke in my testimony about the symbiotic relationship between a strong technology base and our national security interests, because mm -hmm. this is how we maintain a, a strong uh, security for the United States. Uh, secondly, we should point out that anything in this executive order that we're discussing doesn't apply in China, and it doesn't apply to these other nations I was just discussing. That's right. The UAE, the Saudi Arabia, whatever else. They can do whatever they whatever want. Whatever they want. They right? don't have to follow U.S. So law or regulations. We can't put our head into the sand and think mm -hmm. that just because we're constraining our companies, they're constraining theirs. I, I just want to ask, are there, are there countermeasures that, that are, are at hand to, to allow us to sort of push back on some of this and, and, and reveal its, its uh, you know, uh, I guess, uh, negative nature and, and uh, its falsity? Yes, I, I'll just mention one, and my sure. colleagues will have more. Uh, Representative Rochester has a really good bill having to do with AI literacy and education and trying to find ways to teach uh, our electorate and our citizens that there are dangers out there, including misinformation in, uh, in campaigns and elsewhere in the market side. So that's a good baby step to take to get at, to partially get at this problem, which is a serious problem. Um, Jonathan Bidlack joins us now, director of the governance program at the R Street Institute. Some people think this is a scam. President Biden's latest action on student debt. Good morning, Jonathan. How are you? I'm great. Thanks for having me. Thanks for taking the time. So th this seemed to uh, to me have fallen between the cracks of the news. I don't know if a lot of people noticed it or not, but let, take us back to give us some context. The initial plan was for the Biden administration to forgive how much in student debt and then what happened with the Supreme Court. 
Sure, yeah. So, I mean, the basic cost was estimated to be about $420 billion.